Uh, I definitely appreciate the opportunity of coming back. Um, I've been kind of over at business school recently, um, and so this is my first trek back over Eastern Parkway in a while. I'll tell you, the, the vivid memories of being in the electrical and engineering lab and having those breadboards and all the wires wired up and being uh, scared of something, you know, becoming unattached and uh, failing that, you know, with the TA, I think are, I've gotten past that, so hopefully coming back doesn't re-trigger any of that for me. But um, blockchain technologies is definitely something that I'm um, excited about and I've done a lot of research on. And most of my time has been, you know, kind of focused on how it could apply within the healthcare space. Um, and so that's where that white paper came from. You know, the, uh, the government through Human Health Services asked for, you know, white papers for people to submit and, and, and discuss how these technologies could potentially impact healthcare. And they have a couple of initiatives that are going on. And so they wanted to know how it could impact their initiatives specifically. And so um, Humana gave me the, the permission space to kind of go and, and write that white paper and, and propose some ideas. And it was, a, it was a great opportunity for me and ended up um, you know, being selected as one of the winners. And there was you know, MIT and Deloitte and some guy who's never wrote a white paper before and Accenture and all these people. And I think that um, really that demonstrates some of the opportunity within this space. It is pretty much a green field and a lot of um, research going on. Certainly when you move out of FinTech and start looking at other places and other opportunities for it. And so that was one of the reasons for um, connecting with you know, Back to Speed School and wanting to share more about it just because there is so much opportunity, not just um, within the technology space to understand you know, some of the new components that are there, but also within the different models and products that'll probably pop up um, on top of this new platform as we, we have that paradigm shift. And so that's kind of the two takeaways that I wanted to, to leave everybody with is that we do have a paradigm shift that blockchain represents and going from centralized systems to decentralized systems. And with that, it's gonna come kind of a green space and a lot of opportunity. Um, I know that um, there's a lot of jobs out there where they're trying to see people who have any talent at all and have uh, hands-on experience with blockchain. And then there's a lot of strategy folks within companies that are trying to get their head around how this could impact their revenue streams or what new products this could enable. Um, and so what the other um, piece with this is that that paper was not just, you know, about healthcare in general, um, but it was more about how claims, you know, which is kind of the lifeblood of payers and health insurance companies, could be moved out of the centralized system of Humana or other payers and onto an industry utility. So the fact that Humana let me share that um, just kind of rocks their, you know, foundational systems and how they're set up. I think was was pretty great. Um, so let's let's go into the the overview. I'll start and talk about blockchain specifically and kind of dig into some of that, um, and then go into the current state being what's going on with some of these different industries, especially within the fintech space, and then kind of rolling into healthcare and not just healthcare and what some of the predictions are, but also the different examples within that domain, and then kind of uh, finish up with how to stay connected and how to get included in there. Um, and so when we look at what blockchain is, um, it's hard to talk about it without first starting with how it came about and being you know, really the underpinnings of Bitcoin. <coughs> so just to get everybody on the same page, in October 2008, um, there's a a person or a figure named Satoshi Nakamoto who submitted this white paper and sent it to an email list for people who were really into like crypto or crypto cryptographic um, theories and, and discussion. And so after that white paper went and got released, it got a lot of attention and got an open source community um, kind of saying, hey, well, let's go implement this solution. And that was Bitcoin and that was released in January of 2009. And so if you think about what Bitcoin does, it really satisfies a, a very niche uh, market in the sense of being able to exchange an asset between these two anonymous parties. And then the way that it does that, you know, through this decentralized architecture, um, it, it's, it's really elegant and unique in the way that it also incentivizes the different participants to um, be engaged so that it's an autonomous solution. You know, there's not a Bitcoin company, there's not a set of Bitcoin servers, you know, that are run, and the fact that this is open source and running that peer-to-peer -peer is, is a very neat um, solution. And so when we talk about it, if we, if we look at what blockchain is, because I know that we use that term a lot, and you'll see 
you know, from the computer science perspective, you see, you know, block space chain, and that's referring to this distributed database and how those transactions or, or records are stored in a block and with, you know, a collection of records that are linked to a prior block that are linked to a prior block. Um, and so that was the base of Bitcoin. So then, uh, now the, the term, though, has been shoved into its blockchain is for really referring to a set of technologies, no longer just the distributed database, but all the technologies that make this stack work. And so some of these, um, you'll even see uh, distributed ledger technologies used because they're not using blockchain underneath, but potentially using another distributed database. But it's the same kind of principles. They've just found um, a better solution for their particular use case. And so if we want to talk about these different technical components, we can start with you know, that distributed database. And so if we use the example of the audience and say we all have a computer and we've all went and downloaded Bitcoin and we represent the universe of, of Bitcoin users, that would mean that we all have a record or the, the set of records of every transaction that's happened since 2009 on Bitcoin. And so that level of transparency that everybody has, every transaction, and from that you can deduce what the balances are um, for each person because you have each of the transactions. And so when we think about that, you think you also, um, you want an anonymity, right? You don't want to know, if everybody has it, you don't want to know, uh, or people to know exactly what your balance is. And so that's where that public key cryptography kind of fits in, be able to hide that and be able to have some anonymity there. And now that we that we've moved and we say, hey, everybody has a copy of this data source, and now we have more of this peer-to-peer -peer architecture versus the centralized architecture, we've introduced this, this other new problem in the sense that now we need to have consensus. And so we would need you know, consensus of this group to be able to agree on what the next block is. And so if we had, you know, here are the people in the front that decided to collude and go in a different direction and give themselves money. They have to have 51% to be able to get that consensus and continue adding on to the blocks um, to be able to make that happen. So that's where you know you hear trust and you hear transparency and those things are, are coming from is the fact that everybody has a copy of it as well as you need um, consensus. The other piece that's important to note is if, if we're all running it here, we, we have these, these different um, roles we can play within the network. We can be a, a read-only role and being able to look and see the data. You can also have transactional roles where you're actually moving funds from one account to another account. And then you can also have the mining role of where you're actually doing the, uh, the pulling from the queue, picking a block, and then doing the, the computational proof of work within the Bitcoin. And there's other you know consensus mechanisms, but within Bitcoin it's that proof of work to be able to uh, receive that reward um, of the digital asset for being able to add that next block. And so the other neat place um, this goes is now that we all have the data, we also have to have a copy of the logic. And so within Bitcoin, that logic is fairly limited. You know, it's kind of just moving information or a transactional record to say this, update this account balance, you know, with this other number, right? So move $5 from this account over to this account. And so in 2015, you saw or there was a lot of research and the big shift of everybody talking about it now versus when this came out in 2009, is people started to say, well, what if we could really mature that, um, that contract logic that's going on and be able to do different things with it? And so that's where Ethereum kind of comes in and there's, other, there's a lot of other implementations that are doing it. They're trying to say, all right, well, let's allow a lot more logic and so the, the shift with that is, is, if you look at how we currently organize software, it's normally like these centralized entities, and we're moving toward APIs, and so you're throwing data at this API, and then it comes back and gives you an answer. But all that logic is behind that API. Whereas the difference is with smart contracts, that logic now within this blockchain network is shared. And so that logic is visible, and that you can see it, and that everybody now has a copy of that logic. Um, and so with that comes uh, concerns. And so if you're saying, hey, I want to have uh, my business use it, and you know now you can't have company confidential information in that, right? And so there's different barriers that come with this as well, but you can start to see that it, it, the paradigm shift of going from centralized to decentralized, moving the data as well as the logic, and having it run on this platform that everybody can utilize. And so the advantages that come out of that is now we have this indelible record. So everybody has a copy of it, it's all linked to the prior block, so it makes it really hard to go back in the past and have a fraudulent record. Um, and from that, you also can have you know, data provenance. And that's where the, a lot of the early work within healthcare is, is they're really not 
trying to do transactional logic, but instead using this blockchain data structure to say these records haven't changed. And there's also research within the government spaces just to use blockchain to store the hash code um, and the representation of this data over time so they can prove that this data hasn't changed. And Estonia is actually going through the effort of publishing within their, their periodical within the country the actual hash code output at a certain time so that now you have a physical record out there that points to it too, which makes it even harder to go back and say, you know, here's the, this change um, in this record at this time. And so those were the kind of the early cases. You can also um, deduce from the peer-to-peer -peer architecture you're gonna have more resiliency. So as people leave this room and come back in this room in our example, like they would be able to join the network and then that our, the resiliency would be related to the number of people um, that were involved. And then kind of from this, you can see uh, the disintermediation from a business case. And so now if I'm allowed to exchange assets with someone else, and have trust in that, and I don't need a bank in the middle of us to <coughs> negotiate and adjudicate that transaction. Now we have a platform that allows um, some of these intermediaries that are currently existing in our different value chains within the business world to be removed. And so I think that's where you see FinTech moving toward, and that's where you see these different use cases where they're looking at costly intermediaries, not just in uh, transactional fees, but also in time, and trying to find out how they can leverage this technology in more of a business to business type relationship in order to push down some of those costs as well as move toward you know, more real time transactions. And so this is just an example that kind of paints a picture of the, the different blocks and how that's made up. I know sometimes it, uh, it's a lot easier to see. Um, you also see the, the Bob and Alice is the, the constant you'll see within uh, the, the Bitcoin or blockchain examples. It's always Bob sending a, a transfer over to Alice. Um, but you can see these trend Transactions blocks have the proof of work identifier as well as a link to the prior block, and that's just the group of transactions. So that's how that data is kind of stored within that uh, blockchain data set underneath. And so I know if, you, if you've done any reading on this out there in, in the literature, there's a ton of press around blockchain and how it's just going to improve everything and how it's going to really remove intermediaries, it's going to drop the cost of all these things, and that. You know, businesses are, are really scared of some of the implications and that's why they're investing so much. I believe there's over a billion dollars invested uh, between blockchain and Bitcoin last year, um, just in people trying to, you know, test and learn on some of these ideas and do innovation within this space. However, there are, um, and so I want to level set because I think the, the, right, the rest of my presentation is kind of hypey. <laughs> so this is more like here are the challenges uh, which are many for this technology. And I think it's important as we're we're looking at use cases and saying, hey, what really fits to be aware of some of these different challenges because it's definitely being positioned as something that can solve problems that it really doesn't have a good fit um, to solve. And so with the, the size of the network being a, a key part of blockchain and its resiliency and the value that it's at being uh, a networking effect related to the number of people that are involved, Having a use case that drives adoption and has the correct incentives for all the players to want to participate is a key part. So having your own blockchain within a very a small enterprise doesn't make as much sense because there's other technologies and ways that you can share information. So it's not just an interoperability solution, it also is um, more for these different people who don't particularly trust each other or need some level of trust in the data across you know, a, a particular network or a particular use case. Um, one of the other barriers when we move, FinTech has uh, some very, uh, out, has outlined their standards a lot better with data and how they transfer data between each other than some of the other industries, so they kind of have an advantage there. When we start looking at other industries, especially within healthcare and the wide data sets within healthcare, the standards of data and what a claim looks like and what you know a medical record looks like has a lot of variation and nuances. There are standards out there, I'm not trying to say they're not, but there are nuances that um, provide a lot of overhead um, and interoperability or in you know integration scenarios. And so those will go away with blockchain, they'll still be there. And so solutions that suffer from standardization problems will continue to suffer from standardization problems. Um, and then the other parts, Part of this is governance. And so now when we look at 
you know, an open source solution, who owns that, what kind of governance do we have for release cycles and things of that nature, um, to be able to use it as more of an industry utility that other, you know, corporations or, or people would be leveraging. And, and just being aware of the immaturity of the technology. Yes, Bitcoin's been around for 2009, but a lot of these innovations haven't been around and hardened for very long. You're not seeing a lot of um, other use cases go to market and have adoption and, and be public. There's a lot of proof of concept things. And so as these things go out and as these things go live, you're gonna learn a lot more about how they handle um, maturity and scale, as well as how they can account for um, privacy and security. And so when we're looking at you know some of the, the use cases within the financial industry and they're trying to communicate uh, between the different businesses and use it as a platform, there is company confidential information in there that they don't want to share. And so the solutions are having to try to um, figure out how they balance the purest blockchain view with the actual, you know, um, trying to take a step forward along the path. Um, so with that, here's the, the Gardner hype curve or hype cycle that you'll see with, with other emerging technologies. And so with FinTech, we're saying, hey, we're, we're at the top of this, or believing we're near the top for blockchain. However, as um, some of these solutions roll out this year and next, we're gonna start learning more about where it fits and where it doesn't and where some of these challenges are and kind of come down this curve um, into, down into that trough of disillusionment and then, and then come back up into that, that plateau. And so how far we are up and when that's gonna come down is gonna be hard to say, you know, forward looking, um, but I, I expect with the number of applications that people are planning on releasing and that the consulting firms are saying are gonna be released, that within 2017, we're gonna to start to come down this curve for FinTech. However, when you look at healthcare and logistics and some of these other industries that are really digging in, they're probably gonna have their own hype curve associated to it, and it should probably just be a little more muted as they can take um, advantage of some of the FinTech learnings. And so IBM's kind of done some research as well as Deloitte into, you know, here's what we believe from an adoption perspective um, is going to occur, you know, and how it can go from where it is now as a mature state with the POC's research into, you know, um, more of a mainstream um, state. And so they're looking at it as 2015 was more research and 2016 with the POC's and 2017 more of these early adopters. Um, and then there's also, you know, talk within the healthcare space of, you know, there being releases of software in 2017 as well. And so I haven't heard specifically who those are and what they're planning to do, but the, the research out there is pointing to that. So this is kind of where FinTech is. There's a lot of um, use cases around transfer of money between different banking, you know, units. And so if you look at the, <coughs> Cross-border transactions is a, a big focus on this because there's a lot of intermediaries. If you are going to transfer money from here to Japan, banks are only going to transfer money between banks that they have a relationship with. And so it can end up taking a lot of hops and each of those hops takes time and money. Um, and so Bitcoin being able to, um, or blockchain, sorry, being able to overcome some of those hurdles with trust, they're looking at you know, trying to disrupt their first believe that one of the consulting firms said that just within um, cross-border transactions, there's $19 billion uh, of uh, revenue to be realized on a, like a per year basis. And so that's what kind of got everybody fired up about trying to figure it out and figure out where else it plays. Um, another example was when, in 2014, when Ukraine had um, a revolution was on the brink of revolution, they were using it um, as a QR code, and so that you could scan it with your phone, and within, after you scan it on your phone, within three clicks now, you can send you know value over to these people and fund this revolution, um, and it's because it's anonymous, they don't know where it's coming from, and it's a lot harder for them to lock down than something like a PayPal, as well as a lot cheaper for you know everybody that's involved, because if you did that through traditional banks, it would take two to four days and cost you at least 10%, whereas now it takes, or with Bitcoin, it would take like 20 seconds and then actually be permanent and an indelible part of the record after like 10 minutes or 30 minutes, depending on you know, some of the other factors that are going on there. And so transitioning now into healthcare, this outlines a lot of the different um, use cases that IBM kind of put forward and said, hey, 
when we look at the healthcare space, here's what we believe are the use cases out there. So they presented this um, to the to the human health services folks and trying to uh, get everybody aligned around here with what we believe that space is. Um, recently, it was announced that the FDA has partnered with IBM for a two-year venture to look at how they can share clinical results as well as medical record type information on a blockchain. There's a lot of, um, I guess, concern within the clinical results uh, space that these uh, results are, are either being changed or there's cross-contamination going from people participating in multiple things at the same time. Um, and so they're not really um, using the same you know, test case of these people were involved and these people were placebo type of deals. And so they're trying to figure out how they can use blockchain and the uh, mutability of its information on there to, to move that forward. And you'll also see, because financial transactions are where a lot of the innovation is occurring in the fintech space, looking at medical claims or the different financial parts of other industries as the first um, venture into blockchain because it's an easier step than moving into a whole separate domain with a whole separate data set. Um, and then we already talked a little bit about the provenance and traceability and what Estonia is doing there. The, the, the neat thing that enables Estonia to move forward faster than other folks is they all um, already have a digital ID for all of their citizens. And so it allows them to link everything to that digital ID, which is a little harder to do in countries that don't have that set up. And so I'm just going to go through two other, or two like more detailed examples of where this could play within the healthcare space. If you um, are aware of provider directory, and so when I'm saying provider, I mean like doctors and specialists and those folks. The demographics around um, that data, when you go to you know search for them, is normally not great. And this comes from a CMS um, audit. And it's, it's the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, and. What they did is they went and audited the, I think, 54 different organizations and looked at their data to say, do you have accurate provider data? When I so search for a provider, is the, is the name right, is the place right, or the address, all, all that stuff. And they found that roughly 40% of that data was incorrect in some way. And so half of the people they surveyed had more than half of their data wrong. Um, and so there's a huge problem with data, and if you look at it from the doctor's perspective, they have 70 potential you know, payers that they may have to work with, and so if we change a phone number or we move an address, I have to talk to a lot of people to go have them update that information. And so there's not a, it's a, it's a lot of overhead for the provider, and they're the ones who are aware of the event. And so as a payer, you know, a health plan trying to get that information out has been a challenge, and so the outcome of this the CMS said, hey, every quarter you guys need to reach out and connect with your providers and make sure your data is up to date. And so the industry, and that, that happened kind of like toward the end of last year, and so the industry is trying to figure out the best way to solve for that. And if you look at what blockchain enables, there's a way in which to make a, a more of an industry utility for this provider data, um, as well as to put some of the financial mechanisms and incentives there for people to um, get paid for updating this information, as well as to have people pay in to consume this provider information. And since it's already public information, knowing a doctor's name, the phone number, and their specialty, and those things, it doesn't have the same barrier of entry um, that it would if you were trying to look at you know, a medical health record or something of that nature. Um, so I think this is, you'll start to see things like this emerge first where we're, we're looking to try to find, hey, what does everybody, what can everybody benefit from? And what's public data and starting there? And then if you, you look at how that could mature, and if you already have all the provider data information, now you can figure, or you can have them add scheduling um, on top of that, which is also you know a, a lower barrier of entry than like a medical record. And the value that would add to the industry is, is, is significant. So right now, if you try to go and schedule a specialist, I don't know if anybody's had to do that, but it, it's not easy, um, and then you're having to go shop across and find different appointments. Um, it, it's just not uh, centralized. Um, so being able to offer a solution that would enable kind of a one place to go and look, even though underneath it would be a decentralized architecture, would be um, a large benefit uh, to the community itself. And so switching from that more into <coughs> claims, and this is really um, the basis of where I, where I wrote my, my white paper, 
is when we look at the different stakeholders in the medical claim process, we have providers, we have the health plan, and then we also have the government. And as I said before, this provider may have to work with 70 different payers or health plans. And so if they're submitting claims, they, they need to be able to integrate with those. And typically, they're using an intermediary to do that. And they're using some like clearinghouse in order to aggregate that information and get it over so that they don't have to deal with it. And then the, and so there's a lot of friction in this process. Um, and so if we go to, you know, the, the current state, you know, without blockchain, there's all this off-chain communication and these APIs that are being used. And if we add blockchain to it, now we have the potential to go in and have a common industry platform that you can reach out and grab, not just the contract, so the contract between the patient and the health plan, so you would know what that person's coverage is, you could also know what um, the relationship between the provider and the health plan. And so with both of those contracts now out and available for everybody to access, now you can go in and utilize the same interface versus having to touch APIs across 70 different pairs. Um, the neat part about this is because your Bitcoin's already proven that you can use a ledger for uh, or share this ledger, there's a lot of similarity between that and your accumulations. And so looking at how much you've already spent toward your deductible in this area or that area and keeping uh, like an <coughs> accurate track of that in near real time would allow a cost share conversation with a provider that you currently don't have. So if you go to a doctor and say, how much is this going to cost? That's a very complicated question right now for them to answer depending on the service and depending on your coverage. There's just a lot of factors. So a lot of times we'll say, I don't know, right? Or you have to call this person or we'll mail that to you or, you know, and so that's a conversation that can happen. So there's separation that you don't see in other industries between the actual service and the payment. And so you're going in and getting a service without a clear picture of what that payment is. And there's other factors in that play to this. Um, in the sense that if you submit a paper claim, you know, there's a six week lag time on that. So if now that's coming in and that impacts the accumulations, um, that can change, you know, what you're going to pay. So there's, there's other factors that aren't technology. And so I'm not suggesting, hey, if we do this, we can do it this way and it'll solve all the problems. And I think that's another thing to be aware of with blockchain is a lot of the problems that we're having within healthcare, especially with um, the, the transfer of data aren't really, um, technology problems, you know, it's more of the incentive and adoption problems. So right now, Humana offers the ability to do a real-time claim so we can integrate. However, that's not really highly utilized. And there's a lot of providers that already have processes built around paper claims and paper checks, and so there's not a huge incentive for them to change their process um, because they already have something in place. And so, but if we look at what the, the value this could add, there's still gonna be a need for APIs and off-chain communication, certainly, um, with the maturity of the technology and not knowing if we can put, you know, PHI or the health information on the chain as well as identifying information on the chain. The other piece that um, this would, would help add, uh, add value to is being able to spot fraud, waste, and abuse by the government or by the government doing auditing earlier. So right now, if the government comes in and says, hey, we're going to do an audit, it normally will look at a very... Um, a, a box of time and say I want to see all your claims between this time and this time and then pull those and, and look at those for whatever uh, standardization and the federal could have different standardizations than the state and there's a lot of overhead around that process and it's a time lag and they were looking at it by you know centralized entity of payer to the next payer to the next payer whereas if it was all going across the same ledger that could now be you know monitored for fraud waste and abuse in near real time in like a, a standard way. And then the piece that, that I have within my white paper is because data is cheap, and that's really what blockchain is um, taking advantage of, is the fact that you, know, you can store this whole ledger and data is fairly cheap, is the ability for us to salt that information. And so now if we add fictional records on top of the records that are actually real and have a mechanism in place um, for the people that care to be able to, to determine fictional from non-fictional, there, there's a way in there to hide some of the uh, PHI information and make it harder for people um, to figure out the same way that we use salts um, and passwords and other things of that nature. Um, so the last piece here is, is kind of just paying uh, the, the data structure. And so if we look at within the healthcare, you know, within 
financial, it's easier to say, hey, it's moving from this account ID to this account ID, and it's just a number. When we move to healthcare, you know, how we de-identify the different stakeholders that are involved, as well as transfer that information as that cryptographic one-way hash and associate that to the claim so that the blockchain can actually process that information. And then the piece around needing this API URL to store the additional. And so we know that a claim may have you know, tons of information associated to it, but there's a very small amount of information that we need to, in order to process it. And so kind of leveraging the blockchain, the, the example given is a, like a card catalog, in the sense that it would have the reference point of where to go find the book of information, and that would be extremely valuable because now as a person, if, if you were to walk into a doctor's office and say, hey, I have this medical record, you have to share it. If you don't have it physically with you, you know, the ability for them to go and get that information from the other either doctors that you went to or other, you know, insurance companies that you work with is really, really tough. Um, whereas if we could leverage this as more that reference point to be able to get the information to help overcome that hurdle. Um, and so the last thing here is, you know, is just sharing, you know, ways that you can get engaged. Um, so you can, you know, go get your own wallet, connect to Bitcoin and kind of get familiar um, with what that looks like, um, being a miner, so participating and you know spending resources in order to kind of see how that works. Um, that's typically done a lot um, by people that really do that as their job. You know, there's a lot of mining within Bitcoin. These things that by people that are really trying to do make it uh, money. So, uh, but participating I think really helps you understand kind of how it works. Um, and then you know the open source projects. So all these. Um, different companies, whether it be Intel or Digital Asset or IBM themselves, are donating their code to Hyperledger. And so it's out there for you to be able to go and look at and potentially even participate in. Um, and then, you know, creating a DApp on Ethereum. So Ethereum's, you know, kind of this newer um, blockchain implementation that has a wider set of, uh, it's, it's a lot more developer friendly, we'll say it that way. And so because of that, you can kind of go in and there's tutorials. Microsoft has you know, ways that you can plug it into Visual Studio and be able to go and create an application that runs on their platform. And then we're also looking to start a, uh, a local <coughs> blockchain meetup. And so if you'd be interested in that, definitely give me a yell and we can go from there. Um, and I'll end it with that and hope for giving everybody a blockchain. So if there's any questions, feel free to let me know. Yeah, so um, they co-wrote a, a paper with uh, IBM Polsky up at the front, and it was the work done by one of his students, and uh, it was to insert information into actually the Bitcoin blockchain uh, using encoding and decoding functionality. And one of the things that came up when going over that paper is that um, the anonymous component is not as nearly as strong as people think it is, because you can easily form uh, linkage patterns between different wallets, and if there's enough transactions, you can kind of pinpoint who it is. You might not be able to put a name on them, but uh, you can at least identify them and, and use other techniques to then right. remove the shroud. And so I, I like that you mentioned salting the blockchain for PHI, but if you're really wanting to anonymize PHI, is blockchain the best way to ensure that people's Information. I mean, if you're a patient that has frequent visits to a, you know, a, a doctor or something like that, it, it, it's in the blockchain. Once it's there, it, it's, it's there forever. And you don't get another serial number, right? Right. So, uh, is that potentially an issue where once it's been once it's been doxed to the, <laughs> to the blockchain, it's doxed permanently? That that's never going to you know go away. Right. No. And I think that that's you know what we're saying. Hey, this is an aspirational goal and solution. I think the maturity of the technology, we'll see where that goes. I know that Zcash and some of these um, other implementations are trying to tackle more of those problems with the anonymity. Um, and then there's also usage patterns, like you are saying, that um, you could potentially abstract from the user to be able to help with, with some of those things and making them create a new transaction ID for each thing. Um, but I do believe there's a high hurdle right now to getting health information on the blockchain. And so you are going to see it more of a the, the card catalog type of model of where you might have an ID and URL to be able to go look it up. And so at that first step, being able to use the same mechanisms we use to secure APIs and those things, 
and then leveraging it more to be the, the reference point for that information. So the size of blockchain just for Bitcoin is over 60 gigabytes right okay. now. Yes. People like you adding all sorts of non-transaction data to it, will the exponential explosion be even worse? Do you have a solution for it? Well, I don't think that the like B to like B to B solution. So like if Humana or other like healthcare, a lot some are looking at Bitcoin as the back end, but most are looking at creating their own implementation. Whether they you know so they're not going to be held to you know adding to or working on. I do believe it's your foundational point of that this data is going to become so large that it's going to limit some of the things that we can do until we can figure out a way to do it. Um, one of the things I mentioned in my paper is that with healthcare, you, you don't need um, a ledger that goes back forever. Certainly if you're looking at the financial transactions with your health plan and the product coverage that you have, it's more yearly or annually. And so because of that, you could honestly have different forks you know, for each year or maybe even start at the new year and use a ledger that's relational to you know, your accumulations that you've built up over that time. And so I think it depends on the use case, but I don't, I think that there's certain data sets that aren't gonna make sense. And that's where I'm like uh, concerned or, or interested to see where there's a company named Factum that Bill Gates and Melinda Gates and their foundation has invested in to do um, medical health records in Africa and use blockchain and that company uses Bitcoin underneath. And so I'm interested <coughs> to see like how that plays out. And I do think that you're going to see um, more innovation for health data sharing on blockchains outside the US before you see it in the US because the, the decreased regulations and so I think you know within Africa and what they can do and potentially get away get away with there that wouldn't work here as well as I believe uh, Dubai has said that they're going to put a lot more of their government things on blockchain and, and kind of go all in including the health records and so I mean, I think that's where this innovation and these learnings will come about how they can mature the technology to be able to use it in that space. Well, it sounds like you're saying there's going to be a million different small local chains instead of a global blockchain. Doesn't that defeat the whole purpose of? I think it'll be purpose driven. I think they'll create, and they may create side chains, and you know, and find a way to in order to sync them. But I believe that you'll end up yes having separate chains for separate things and that are use case driven, at least early on, just so that they can kind of um, make those more purpose driven, because they may have different consensus algorithms for different, you know, like proof of work works great for Bitcoin, but it doesn't really, isn't really needed if it's in a bank to bank transaction, they can use something else like proof of stake or something to that effect. And so I think it'll, it's just gonna depend, and that's where I think, when we're talking about 2017, a lot of these people rolling out, Visa is doing, you know, a thing with a partner uh, named Chain, and they're looking to get to 2,000 transactions per second and be able to put some of their you know, resources over and run transactions on a blockchain. So I think things like that and seeing the innovation and how they solve for those problems will really help us kind of get our, get our arms around what the future really is going to be when it goes mainstream. So would you say it's a good idea then to have middle man managing transactions between blockchains? So if you have Visa network versus Discover network, now do I want to bridge that divide? I think right now they're competing for who's going to be the winner. And I think that the best platform will eventually play out as the winner, but I believe it's going to play out more like an industry utility in the sense that Visa may have investment in it, um, and they may use it and shepherd it and, and be able to realize the economic gain of having more efficient, less friction transaction. But then the goal would be to, to get adoption with everybody else and not keep it within Visa's walls. And so I think as these things all come out into production and we start getting evaluated, that they're gonna find out either how to move those together into a best of breed and, and that's gonna win out and then that's gonna play in that space. So it could be you know, a different one within FinTech, it could be a different one within credit, it could be a different one for cross-border payments. But I think that's kind of where I see it going, at least at first. But then the, I think the protocols go in, so you can look at you know, what we've learned from the web and the different 
protocols and standardizations, I think you're going to see that same kind of thing where you know you have your intranet and your internet, you know, and you kind of move toward we need specifications and standards to let everything communicate so that that's all abstracted from the user and we can actually build a product and experience on top of it. Any more questions? No questions. It's really constant. It looks like it's very exciting. <coughs> no more questions? Would any of you trust putting their medical records on blockchain after the talk? No? <laughs> Who would say yes? No? I would. I have nothing to hide. <laughs> I mean, but anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And, uh, just as a reminder, next uh, we have this extra seminar on Monday at 12.30 in Ernst Hall. It's in collaboration with Electric.